Hello again. Here we are still in July, Julius Caesar's month, so we're doing several talks where Caesar comes into things at least to some extent. And this is the, the next part of The Conquered and the Proud, which is really an extension. My original plan was to go through the 60s and 50s BC fairly quickly and rush into the Civil War, because obviously this, this whole course is covering the best part of 400 years, and it's, it's, it's a broad overview of what's happening. However, because it's July, but also because it's of such interest and it ties in quite well with um, what we're doing with the videos about the HBO Rome series and all of that era, um, it was worth talking a bit more. So last time we looked very much at the 60s, we looked at Catiline and the disturbances then and tried to emphasise that this is a very turbulent period and a very dangerous period. We got to the point where Pompey doesn't return until Catiline has been suppressed, but he's nearly there. By 62, everyone's known from 63 onwards that Pompey's going to be coming home. He defeated Mithridates. He then got a little bit distracted because actually you know, a lot of the military work had been done by Lucullus. And it, to some extent, it added to that reputation Pompey was developing for finishing other people's wars, but taking the credit. On the other hand, his eastern campaigns show all the hallmarks of, of Pompey's military leadership, very well organised, good logistics, and boldness as well, so that he does charge around with an awful lot of diplomacy. You know, much of this is a period where he settles the eastern kingdoms and creates a few provinces. You have Syria, for instance, turned into a Roman province, though much of it isn't as big as the province will later become. He intervenes in a civil war between the Jewish royal family and captures Jerusalem after a three-month siege. Uh, Pompey you know, famously goes into the, the Holy of Holies in the temple, but doesn't take anything from it. But nevertheless, it's a you know, major violation of the taboo surrounding this. You shouldn't do it for anybody, let alone a, you know, a Gentile general. Um, but um, he has been successful. He has won victories. He's taken Roman armies to new places, defeated peoples, or made them submit that is the first to do that. So he will come home and his triumph eventually will be celebrated. Let's just read that actually, as it's quite a good indication of um, the scale of what he's done. So you have Gnaeus Pompeius Mangonus, Imperator, having completed a 30 year war, routed, scattered, slain, or received the surrender of 12,183,000 people, sunk or taken 846 ships, received the capitulation of 1,538 towns and forts, subdued the lands from the Crimea to the Red Sea. Uh, having rescued the seacoast from pirates and restored to the Roman people the command of the seas, celebrated a triumph over Asia, Pontus, Armenia, Paphlagonia, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Syria, the Scythians, the Jews, the Albanians, Iberia, the, the island of Crete, the Bastani, and in addition to those over King Myth, kings Mithridates and Tigranes. So you have... If you think back to when we looked at earlier um, monuments and proclamations by triumphing generals, this is that just far bigger. You know, 12 million people you've, um, you've defeated. It's um, huge. Now, how reliable the numbers were, particularly when it comes to enemies and this sort of thing, big, big question. Exaggeration is key, but nevertheless, this is a triumph combining the war against the pirates and the wars in the east against Mithridates and more generally in that area. Pompey returned with these spectacular achievements with vast quantities of money to add to his already substantial wealth, with lots of his senior officers and others who'd done very, very well, thank you very much, during these campaigns through his generosity. But he was also coming back with an army, and there was suspicion about that by, as we mentioned last time, you know, the last person to come back from the East having defeated Mithridates with an army was Sulla, and look what he did. Now, obviously, that was an ongoing civil war, at least from the perspective of hindsight, but Pompey was one of Sulla's men. What might he not do? There is always a tendency, and you can see this in public life today, where people who are nervous often suspect that others would do what they would do if they had the resources available to those others. So, you know, you, ha you get the feeling some senators are thinking, well, if I was Pompey and I had this massive, incredibly loyal, efficient army at my back and all this money, 
yeah, maybe I would make myself dictator. Why not? Get rid of all my enemies, get rid of everyone I don't like. Um, wouldn't that be good? What's to stop me? Even if they don't think that, they can see that as a possibility and they don't know Pompey. And Pompey was a difficult man to read. And Cicero says this later on in the, in the 50s, that you, you look at that face, you just don't know what he's thinking. Um, he is not an experienced politician. He has spent those three years before the pirate command from 70 through to, to 67 in public life at Rome. But he'd had to get Varro to write him a textbook on, you know, how does the Senate work, what he was supposed to do in public life, because he'd done nothing before that. He hasn't followed a normal career. Um, other than the consulship, he's never had to campaign or canvass for a, an um, elected office at all. Um, he's just been given things and he's just had an army. He's been very good at commanding armies and winning wars. So Pompey is a figure of fear until he arrives back, at which point he does the decent thing. And he makes it very clear, look, I want my triumph, feel I've deserved it. Um, and, you know, here are all the achievements. So really, yeah, well, fair enough, that's, that's okay, you can do that. So it's sort of double triumph from the two commands. But that's it, I'm not, I'm then going to disband my army and I'm just going to be a senator like everybody else. I'm not expecting new elected office, anything like that. However, what I would like is that while I've been out east, I have reorganized the whole area. Apart from creating Syria, changing the boundaries of some of the other provinces, I have established dynastic leaders in lots of these communities. I've the governments elsewhere in various cities. I've established the rights between individuals. I've reorganized the whole area and confirmed this is how things are. This is how they should be. So I would like all that approved. I've done this with great thought, with great care. I've done it in the interests of the Roman Republic. I've done it sensibly. Can you just approve this as one thing, my actor, all my deeds in one go? So that's one thing I want. The second thing he wants is my soldiers have fought with great courage and great skill and great success against enemies of the Roman Republic. Many of them are poor men. I would like you as the representative of the state to reward them for this service by giving them farms. I've got lots of men who no longer wish to be soldiers, but they'd like to be able to support themselves, their families become good, solid Roman citizens, members of the state. And that's basically what Pompey wants. And again, you have to think that in both respects, this is pretty reasonable. You know, this is, it's not unprecedented, but there's no fixed basis whereby you, you know, you serve your time in the army and you automatically get land or a bounty at the end of it, which will come in under Augustus. But it's a reasonable thing. And Pompey has won the war and he's saying, look, I don't want to be dictator, I'm just going to be another senator. The problem is that this is perceived as weakness. He's now perceived as vulnerable. And you have men like Crassus who don't like Pompey very much, and, you know, are eager to do him down. But also you have Catulus, others, established member of the, you know, the, the big families who see, well, I don't really want a, a Rome that's dominated by Pompey because he's got all this glory, he's done all these great things, he's got all this money, all this influence. Yes, he says he doesn't want office, but he could still be the man who basically calls the shots in the Senate and in public life. And if he's doing that, it means I'm not doing that. And I don't like that. I would prefer that it's me or somebody like me or somebody I can um, influence and advise. There is a great sense of, well, let's cut him down to size. Now he's done the decent thing and not come back as a, you know, an enemy as the leader in a civil war. He's behaving like a proper Roman um, politician, senator. OK, let's show him how senatorial politics really works and how dog eat dog the whole business is, how difficult it is. Because Pompey isn't good at using his influence. He's got all this money, he's got all this prestige, but he doesn't know how to sidle up to someone and you know, say, oh, you know, ask about the family, do you want a favor, all this sort of thing. The thing that Crassus is very good at, Pompey doesn't know how to do and probably doesn't have the patience to do. He, he's not experienced. That might be partly his nature, but it's also just his life experience. He hasn't done that. And very quickly, it's again this, this Roman political thing. Someone is vulnerable, then others can see, well, there's a chance for me to rise by showing how vulnerable that person is by winning successes against them. So the Senate refuses to 
Grant Pompey's request, his men don't get land, and his actor, his eastern settlement, is not ratified as a whole. That instead, what they say at the Senate is, well, let's look at each individual decision you made and then decide whether or not to approve it. Now, again, this is this is excessive. Yes, ultimately, there should be authority in the Committee against Your Reality will vote on any treaties in the end and approve them or not. Um, but normally there's been considerable delegated authority and the, the, the base has been that if a governor's done this and it seems to work, let's let's do this. Now, eventually, in Caesar's consulship, all of the Pompey's Acta, all of his reorganization of the East is approved. Many aspects of it will still be in force centuries later. You know, you, you come across aspects of this with St. Paul's journey, some of the authorities he comes across. Uh, Pliny mentions decisions made by Pompey in, you know, this is the early second century AD in Bithynia. So what, you know, the, the overall impression is that Pompey's decisions were really good ones, that this was a very thorough, again, it comes back to the talent this man possessed for organization. And he does seem to have done things which by Roman standards were, were good for the good of the Republic, for the good of the, the functioning of the provinces and were not too repressive in that they were able to stay for such a long time once they were finally approved. But this leaves Pompey frustrated. He manages to get one of his men elected consul for the next year, but this chap, Afranius, is not, um, again, as a new man, not politically savvy enough, is blocked at too many points. People realise that Pompey's not very good at, at pulling the political strings, not very good at using his influence, and therefore, well, we can ignore him then. Um, it's incredibly short-sighted and stupid, but it's how the Roman senators of this generation in particular tend to think and operate, enough of them anyway to make a difference. So Pompey is... Um, frustrated, is unable to get what he wants, and it's a major blow to his prestige. And that, of course, means that there's more prestige to go around for other people. In the meantime, Crassus has been one of many investors in um, bidding for the rights to collect taxes in Asia and elsewhere. And again, it's these publicani, these public companies we'll talk about in more detail when we get to look at provincial administration. But we mentioned a little bit in who's profiting from the empire. You bid for the rights to do these things um, in Rome itself, and you basically promise, I will pay so much money to the state, and then you have to go out to the province and collect more than that to make a profit. Uh, when you discover that after the devastation of these you know, decades of war, really, Pompey talks about you know, ending a 30-year war with Mithridates, which is not much of an exaggeration, um, they can't pay. You know, these areas are too poor and they've been plundered by other Roman governors before um, that you, you can't get that money back. And particularly if the governor of the particular province isn't friendly enough to you to allow you to be utterly irresponsible and you know, pretty much provoke rebellion by squeezing the provincials for money that they have or possibly don't even have then these companies end up facing a big loss. And it's bad investments. Crassus is partly implicated, but it's also he's got friends within this community, within the investors that are badly affected. And they are trying to get a reassessment, basically, of the, the initial terms. So basically change, well, we promise we'd pay the state this, but actually in looking at things, that was utterly unrealistic. So let's just pay the state that and then call it quits. Um, again, Cicero at one point talks about this is not, not the most honourable of... Um, endeavors but he can also understand why they're doing it because it affects an awful lot of equestrians and wealthy investors and businessmen uh, many of these um companies and investments they occur particularly through freedmen and others but at sort of levels of distance whereby you're committed to lots of different enterprises uh, rather than necessarily everything being invested in one big thing um, but again that's something we can talk about another day uh, because the way roman business works is different to the modern world but sometimes people make too much of those differences so you end up with both crassus and pompey who individually are the two most wealthy and influential men in the senate because whilst lucullus hortensius people like that they have great wealth it's not invested in a way that gets them much political capital uh, it's it's there to show off and to live a luxurious life. Lucullus pretty much retires when he returns from Asia. He sulks and basically says, well, I'm going to live, live the high life and indulge myself, but um, I, I'm so fed up, you've treated me so badly, I'm not going back into politics, I don't care. Uh, and that's another sign. There is a, a, is a pattern in this era where people are 
sent off to do the Republic's work and do the job well and are then treated really badly when they come back or are recalled early. And it doesn't seem to matter how committed you've been, how successful you've been. Um, you know, you see it with Pompey when he's returned from Asia. And of course, it's the theme as to Caesar's attitude to the Civil War. That, look, I've done all these things for you. Why do you want to condemn me now? Um, and, you know, even... Cicero and others express that opinion. Why do you make Caesar so strong and then want to fight him rather than, um, you know, it doesn't make sense. Um, so this is the, the background to when Caesar will return from his governorship in further Spain, that you have Pompey and Crassus frustrated. They haven't been able to get what they want. Caesar returns once the consulship for 59 BC. Now, he also wants a triumph, and obviously a triumph is a great honour for a Roman politician, but it's a good way of advertising yourself uh, before um, uh, you know, an election campaign season. Great. You know, this, is, this is putting your, your face and your reputation and your deeds before everybody in the middle of Rome itself. However, to celebrate the triumph, he has to keep some of his troops under arms. If he keeps some of his troops under arms and has the Imperium to command them, he has to remain outside the formal boundary of the city, the Pomerium, which means he cannot physically come into the city and canvass and you know, act as a candidate and convince people to vote for him. Um, he asks for you know, a not uncommon um, right to, well, let's just bend the rules, allow me to put my name forward. Even if I can't come in person, then I can celebrate the triumph and I'll complete the rest of the election campaign. This is blocked. There's the influence of several people. It doesn't help that Cato is um, has a marriage alliance with Bibulus. So, you know, he doesn't want... Bibulus is, again, wants to be consul because he's become... He's old enough now to stand for it. He's always been outshone by Caesar at every stage so far in his career. He'd like a nice change where he can just be... Bibulus can be famous for a change and it isn't just Julius Caesar that everyone's um, watching and, uh, you know, praising and doing all these things. So, um, this is blocked. Caesar is not given this right. He then does something which clearly surprised his, um, you know, the people who manoeuvred to do this, and foregoes his triumph. Basically dismisses his army, says, okay, fair enough, I had the honour, but I'm not going to celebrate it because it's more important for me to stand for the consulship. He comes in, he campaigns, and he will eventually win, though with Bibulus as his colleague once again. At some point, and it's not entirely clear who initiates this, although Caesar might well be the, the man who sort of says, look, I've got a good idea for you, but he goes to Crassus and he goes to Pompey. There's probably already an existing connection with Crassus. There certainly is since Crassus had bailed him out and allowed him to go to Spain by covering his debts or acting as, as surety. No apparent connection with Pompey other than affair with Pompey's wife uh, whilst Pompey was away. Um, so there's there's no connection there. Pompey and Crassus dislike each other intensely, but Caesar brings them together, and it, it's we call it the first triumvirate, even though it is not formally a political alliance. It's not anything public. Dio Cassius tells a, a, a story of you know secret oaths to. Do that. I suspect that's much later propaganda. Or it might be propaganda. That's, you know, secret oaths, the sort of thing Catiline and his conspirators do. It's not the sort of thing that respectable politicians would do. Uh, it's, it's what you, you say to blacken somebody's reputation. But deals are done and they agree to, at least privately, Crassus' support for Caesar is fairly open. Pompey's is veiled at least at the start, but he's working to help Caesar get elected. Caesar also allies with... <coughs> Another man who's got more money than him to help uh, spend on the campaign trail, you know, basically going on the same ticket. Uh, the other man doesn't get in, Caesar does. Because, um, as I say, Bibulus is made um, consul with him. So January 59 sees Caesar and Bibulus as consuls. And it's only during the course of the weeks and months that follow that Pompey's support for Caesar and alliance with Crassus, what become the th named the three-headed monster, becomes more apparent. But it's very clear that Caesar has done a deal. Get me elected consul, or help me to be elected consul, and I will solve your problems. I will get for Pompey, land for your veterans, and I'll get your eastern settlement approved. Wholesale. All done. And for Crassus, I will get relief for these companies that have done badly in the, the bidding for the, the taxes. Um, 
again, I, I think one of the comments talked about this as, as an earlier issue. It does seem to be an immediate issue of the late 60s rather than something that's been ongoing. Uh, but then there is this connection. Crassus has, he invests in people as well as property. And Caesar is one of the, those investments where he's put a lot of money into it because he's covering huge, huge debts that Caesar's racked up through getting elected to all these posts, particularly Pontifex Maximus, which surprised everybody that somebody so junior could take on one of the big, big beasts of the Senate and win. Um, and also just through being Caesar and through being flamboyant, through putting on these entertainments, through living a lifestyle that put you in the public eye all the time. And through speaking a lot in courts as well, all, all this sort of thing. So Crassus has backed Caesar and that's what he's going to get in return. So that, that relationship is more obvious. The hostility between Bibulus and Caesar is patent from the very start. Uh, Caesar is the senior consul, so he begins, um, just, just whose name comes up first in the voting, so he begins with the Fasces in January. You have this system whereby um, consuls take it in turns, and for each month, one of them has precedence, he presents his bills, he leads the debates, his um, lictors with their fasces precede him and the others, uh, you know, don't. It's, it's, uh, there are various ways of marking out. Yes, you share the office, but in practical terms, you basically take turns all the way through the 12 months. So one is leading one month on the next. Caesar hits the ground running. He's got big plans right from the very start. Caesar had obviously prepared a lot for his consulship and the legislation he wanted to get through. Now, he worked on and would eventually achieve what Crassus wanted, relief for the, the Publicani. Um, he'd get Pompey's Eastern Settlement ratified, and he would get land for his Pompey's veterans. But also tied in with that, Caesar brought in this major land law of his own, which, apart from former soldiers, planned to give large amounts of public land as farms to poor citizens in Rome itself. Now, obviously, the number of citizens overall had changed, but there was that factor where people who'd ended up not being able to make a go of it or were the younger sons or, for whatever reason, ended up in Rome itself receiving um, public issues of wheat and um, other staples to keep them going and you know, not contributing that much to society or the same. It, it comes back to the same idea, and it goes back to Tiberius Gracchus and so many people in between. There'd been a, an attempt at a major law on this scale by a chap called Rullus just a few years ago, which had been opposed and blocked. Because again, there's lobby interests that don't like the idea of giving away public land to uh, other poorer citizens, but also, more importantly, usually that land was in use semi-legally, perhaps for a long time, by various bigger landowners, many of them either senators themselves or their connections or equestrians, but also now particularly as you've included the Italian aristocracy, it's now Roman as well. Many of these people are still there. But it is one of those issues where there is a pretty broad consensus that there's a problem, that the poor citizens in Rome have no work, have no real livelihood, can't support their families, are an unstable element because they're prey to politicians who promise them anything. Whereas if you go off, set them up on land, they'll breed the next generation of Roman soldiers, but also they'll get on with things. They won't need any more from the state. Caesar had tried to learn from the, the problems surrounding the Roland land law, and he'd brought in different clauses. He also presented this in a very um, conciliatory way. So he presented it to the Senate, but also said, well, look, if there's anything you want me to change, you know, say, and I'll try and do it. Um, he tried to listen to other opinions, but this was going to be blocked by Bibulus, by Cato and others, who just decided that even if they could agree, it was summed up rather um, simply when one critic said, well, I like everything about this bill apart from the man who's proposing it, Caesar. I'm not going to let him get the credit for having done this. Therefore, I'm going to block it. Um, so Caesar tried to do things in the proper traditional way and tried to do it in a very um, you know, practical, um, say, conciliatory way of doing it. 
This was rejected time and time again. People were determined that Julius Caesar wouldn't get credit. They became more suspicious of Caesar as it became obvious that Pompey and Crassus were associated with him and backing him. This sense of a sort of hidden conspiracy spread, which was um, didn't help the cause, even though others obviously thought, well, I've got a connection with Pompey, so I better um, toe the line and vote the way he'd like me to vote. Because it's blocked repeatedly in the Senate, you have Cato attempts to filibuster, basically to keep speaking until the sun sets. Once his opinion's been asked, he won't shut up. And it doesn't matter what he's saying, he just needs to keep talking. Because once the sun has set, then business is suspended. And if they can, with the various festivals and the days when the Senate doesn't meet, delay it through January, then Bibulus takes over in February, so that's delaying it at least until March. It's these sorts of delaying tactics have become meat and drink of Roman politics within the last few generations. But there is this big problem. It comes back to this inertia, this sense that, OK, everybody realises actually there is there is an issue with these poorer citizens in Rome, with the way that publicly owned land is distributed. We could do this better. But I don't want anybody to get the credit for solving it. Therefore, it's better if the problem continues rather than it's actually solved. But somebody I don't particularly like or I envy or I feel is a rival um, has actually got the, the glory for doing the deed. You then get public meetings where Caesar's trying to show to everybody, look, you know, this is really popular. Lots of Roman citizens want this. Do you really want to anger them all, have them um, turned against you by opposing it? Why don't you just let it through? You know, what, what do you lose from this? This is for the good of the state. These start to break down. There's rioting. You have attempts by tribunes to veto it, attempts to block the tribunes from vetoing it. Um, Eventually, it would be passed through the popular assembly um, directly, Caesar doing what tribunes have done in the past. Before that, you've had a riot in which Cato gets a basketful of dung tipped over him. Doesn't seem to be this is serious fighting with weapons. The, the, there appears to be a temp at restraint from Caesar, Pompey, and their, Crassus, their supporters, that they'll they'll bully, but it won't be lethal. So it's it's trying to sort of use controlled, limited violence. Uh, rather than let this break out into open fighting. But obviously, again, the precedents are not good, but nor are the precedents set by Cato and Bibulus and others. Bibulus retires to his house for the remainder of the year, and he's already fed up because people have been joking this was the consulship of Julius and Caesar rather than of Caesar and Bibulus, and claims from there to see bad auspices. So he sees signs of uh, the gods' displeasure with what's happening, and that this, if a consul or a senior magistrate properly observes such bad omens in the right way at the right time and in the right place, then that invalidates all public business. Um, Bibulus is not doing them in the right time, in the right place and in the right way. Nevertheless, it casts a sort of doubt, an element of uncertainty that can be used against Caesar in the future over the legitimacy of everything he does. Because essentially Bibulus sulks and Caesar forces through um, all, all that he wants during the course of year, again with much uh, popular support. And it is always wrong to say the Senate opposes Caesar. It is a group within the Senate surrounding the Boni, the Optimates, people like that. And, um, you know, Cato is a prominent figure. Cato has again been playing this in a way that shows he's doing the same thing as Caesar. He wants personal credit, personal glory, personal fame. So whilst he's rabbiting away one day, refusing to shut up and therefore delaying things and get, trying to get to the, the meeting to close without a decision, Caesar orders his lictors to remove Cato from the Senate. Cato keeps talking and you know, he plays the martyr superbly. And at least one distinguished senator leaves to say, well, I'd rather be in, under arrest with Cato than I would be in a Caesar, in a, left in the Senate with Caesar. Um, so Cato wins lots of publicity victories to some extent, and particularly to his already established support and to people of the middle ground, but doesn't actually achieve anything other than this stub, you're not going to have this, you're not going to have this, which particularly when it's clear that these measures are so popular, people have voted for Caesar in the first place, but also are continuing to support and back that, there is an element where, again, you find it in, in modern politics, where one group will lose a vote or an election, but will refuse to accept that. We'll just keep on and on and on, and we'll try in every way to prevent the, um, the other party or the decision that whatever was made actually being achieved. It doesn't help politics in the long run. Again, it reinforces this sense of 
the selfishness of politicians. They're only concerned about their personal ambition, their personal honour. They don't actually respect the will of the voters, whether they voted as an assembly on a particular thing, whether they've elected somebody and still support them. So the year continues, it's chaotic, but it's always worth remembering when you come back to the build-up to the Civil War, you have to look at this, and for all the disturbances, actually things are much worse after this. There isn't the level of violence and politically motivated killing that you will get when Clodius and Milo are going great guns in a few years' time. What Caesar does is, again, generally considered to be um, for the common good. Most of the laws he passes in his consulship will remain, although he is repeatedly attacked. His law on uh, magistrates and their behaviour um, survives in slightly modified form for most of the Principate. Uh, the land law works um, and is added to later on, but nevertheless, it's you know it is you can make a very good case as Caesar no doubt would that these were good measures for the good of the Republic. Uh, but his opponents hate him bitterly and there is later on they'll talk about you know we can't have a second consulship by caesar look what the first one was like but you actually think well, really you know was it much worse happens on other occasions than is but i think caesar gets associated with that sense of a, a breakdown of order and people hate him for bibulous it's humiliating that you're always being outshone you know you're always the man at the back the one who's not noticed there's this person brimming with charisma who is center stage and he follows you all the way through your career cato is trying to out caesar caesar he's trying to make himself as well known and as popular and he does not win high office to any great degree he gets the praetorship he doesn't get beyond that uh, now, while some of the sort of biographies in the later tradition present him as the, the, the Stoic, the philosopher who's not really interested in office for its own sake, it's actually quite hard to believe that, that as a Roman politician he is not. He certainly wants to be one of the leading members of the Senate, and it is about his auctoritas, his reputation. And I'm sure he is convinced as well that what he, is, what he believes, what he wants, is for the good of the Republic. And that even if in the short term people suffer, in the longer term his vision is a far better one. So you do have to remember the element of, of deep personal dislike between Caesar and Pompey because they are opposites. They are, while they're playing the same political game, they are very different characters. Caesar has charm. He wins people over, whether it's other people's wives he's seducing, whether it's a crowd in the forum. Cato doesn't have charm. He gets respect and people honour him, but he is a damn nuisance to be around. You know, he can be too rigorous, too obsessive in his um, assertions of this is what the virtuous path is in, this is what I'm going to do, as well as bending the rules for the, his nearest and dearest. And it does not help that his half-sister, Servilia, the mother of Brutus, has been Caesar's mistress for a very long time. And their affair appears to be one of the most serious, one of the most important romantic um, liaisons of, of Caesar's life, probably because Servilia is by all indications, a very bright, intelligent, as well as attractive woman. But she has a very clear political brain. You know, she is someone who is promoting the careers of her son, but all her relatives, uh, male relatives, through the marriages arranging with her daughter, but also the advice. She, she makes good connections. When she remarries, she marries somebody important, uh, Bruce's stepfather, Silanus. Um, it's no coincidence that when you get to the aftermath of, of Caesar's murder, one of Brutus's sisters is married to Cassius, one of the others is married to Lepidus. You know, they are with the big names, with the key people. Servilia is someone who is an operator behind the scenes. And my suspicion, this is uh, as, a, as a biographer, um, I think with Servilia and then later with Cleopatra, these are the women that Caesar feels are more his equals, that they have the brains, the savvy, and perhaps the ruthless ambition as well, and the charm um, that lots of other people don't have. But it doesn't help for Cato to know that his, his sister is having an affair with one of his bitterest enemies. And of course, there's the famous story where in, um, during the debate over what to do with the Catalinarian conspirators, not quite sure which day, it's one of those anecdotes Plutarch tells, um, as we mentioned in the last talk, Caesar has been under widespread suspicion. There's been lots of gossip that he is really associated with Catiline, was part of the conspiracy that he really ought to be under suspicion himself. And a note is brought to Caesar during the meeting of the Senate. Cato jumps to the idea that this is some incriminating evidence, that it's something from um, 
someone else associated with the conspiracy, demands that Julius Caesar read this out to the Senate, let everybody know what you're happening. It's, it's a bit like that uh, school thing when someone in the class is caught eating and the teacher says, have you brought enough for everybody? It's this sort of element of um, public shame about it all. Um, Caesar's talks to Cato and says, look, I, I really don't think you want me to do this. Cato keeps on, eventually Caesar hands over the note to Cato, he reads it, and it's a passionate love letter from Servilia, from his sister, to, <laughs> to Caesar, at which point he hands it back and says, you know, take it, you you sot, you drunk, something like that. It, it, it's an odd insult because Cato was the heavy drinker, whereas Caesar was not. He was quite abstemious um, and more of a sort of social element. He would obviously drink in that, but he did there aren't cases of Caesar getting drunk, whereas there are with Cato. So you can't ignore the personal dislike, and it's clearly there with Catulus and others who just dislike Caesar. And there is an element where anyone who is flamboyant, charismatic, charming, those who feel that they've seen past the charm tend to hate that person very, very strongly in a sort of visceral way. And there's also the element that it frustrates them that Caesar is so popular because they're looking out and saying, well, why does everybody like this guy? Why do they support this man when um, I hate him? And, and, and I'm convinced he's, you know, he's going to destroy the state. He's worse than Sulla and all this sort of thing. And there are all these stories that are almost certainly later creations of Sulla when he pardons Caesar, saying, you know, there's plenty of Mariuses in him. Catulus talking about Caesar in the 60s as, you know, beginning to besiege the state and all this sort of thing. Um, it's very unlikely. Caesar's career, whilst flamboyant, and is controversial in the consulship has still been pretty regular. You know, he's done everything at the right sort of age. Um, he's done things perhaps more spectacularly, but he's basically done them in the way that other Roman politicians do them. He's far more conventional than say a Pompey, and he hasn't had the involvement in a civil war that had helped the rise of somebody like Crassus or Lucullus or Catiline even. So it is a little hard to understand the hatred that Caesar evoked in certain individuals, but it's clearly very important as to how these months play out. So Caesar's consulship is turbulent, but he gets a lot done. Um, and all the attempts, you know, the, it's again, the opponents bending the rules, using the religious objections and all this sort of thing. It's casting doubt, but um, then he is granted for his province for the following year the the roads and country paths of, of um italy it's 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 very much a non-job i mean probably it was something that needed to be done but this is not the job that allows someone politician in debt to go off and win military glory um a tribune vatinius then presents a bill to the popular assembly and instead caesar is granted a five-year grand command of illyricum and cisalpine gaul the governor of Transalpine Gaul happens to die in office and the Senate, not the people, actually tack this on. Uh, presumably it's making sense. There have been problems there. The poor old Allobroges who'd helped to um, re uncover the Catalinarian conspiracy end up rebelling because they don't get anything from the Roman state. There have been rumours of the Helvetii being on the verge of migrating into Gaul, of attacking Rome's allies, this over the last couple of years. So it's, it's a a sensitive area, an area of the problem, and it, it makes sense. So there's enough people within the Senate who actually think, okay, let's add this on Caesar, you know, let's make it one command, that's probably the best way of dealing with potential problems in that area. Um, so let's just look before we go on to Caesar in Gaul more broadly at conquest in the first century BC. You, you do have these occasional um, prolonged commands, you know, Lucullus gets three years in the east. Um, Pompey's commands against the pirates is bigger in scale. It doesn't prove to be big in duration. The one against Mithridates, again, is bigger. He's given several years and a, a sort of mega province, a combination of several and far more resources. It goes back to the idea of multiple consulships for Marius uh, to meet the Kimbri and Teutones. This sense that there are some problems that actually require more than the standard. We send out a magistrate for one year with limited resources and he'll, he'll sort it all out. People are realizing that actually it works better if you appoint someone for longer and give them more resources, give them enough to do the job. But it obviously means that a few men, the lucky ones who get these commands, are getting responsibilities and then on the whole proving successful and winning glory and profit on a scale that outmatches everybody else. So it, 
accelerates that um, escalation in a sense of what you need to achieve to be a successful commander, a great commander, the greatest around, to have a better triumph than everyone else, to win more glory than everyone else. The Roman armies are becoming more efficient. It's not fully permanent or professional at this point, but there are more people, particularly officers, who seem to be at least semi-professional and go from one one army to another as tribunes of centurions. Um, many more of the soldiers are joining because they think this is a pathway to something better, hence all this demand for land at the end of, of major campaigns. Um, the cohort structure, if you look at Caesar's legions, they do seem a lot more flexible than the legions of described by Polybius or someone like that. Again, we touched on this a little bit with Marius. There's my um, lectures on the, the legion uh, are in one of the other playlists, and we'll do more on this in due course. But Generally speaking, the Roman armies do seem rather good at this period, at least most of the time, and some of them have the potential to be exceptionally good in, indeed. They show far more skill at siegecraft than they ever have in the past, and that again suggests a continuity of knowledge in the engineering skill, which is sort of, it's another indication of these, these semi-professional, these officers who keep going from one, com one post to another. Um, and generally speaking, they prove superior to pretty much all the enemies they're facing. You know, the armies of Pontus, of Armenia, are numerous, but a bit clumsy, uh, not necessarily well led, and they don't, they are defeated by much smaller Roman armies. You have the sort of dismissive comment attributed to Tigranes of Armenia when he sees Lucullus's Roman army approaching and says, well, there's, you know, there's too many of them to be an embassy, but there's too few of them to be an army and they attack him and they cut his army to ribbons. You know, it's this, this, this shock that it helps as well that you get armies under successful commanders and you win a few engagements and you start getting used to winning. And it's like a successful team in any activity, um, but particularly in the, the military environment. You, you get into the habit of it, you improve, you get better, you trust each other, you're confident, you tend to do better. So you have... Um, Others where you get traditions of more display of impressive rather than close combat. The Romans are very aggressive. And Lucullus is a gifted tactician. Pompey is such a great organiser. The strategy and the tactics the Romans employ are very, very aggressive. But they do balance through what's the best way to attack the enemy. So Lucullus at times uses... Plutarch uses the expression kicking the enemy in the guts. He doesn't fight a battle when he thinks he can outmaneuver them or use siege lines to starve them and then defeat them. You fight when it's right. You fight in the best circumstances when they favor you the most. And it's that care that they take. Um, Pompey will drive around as with Lucullus. You know, they push way beyond Asia Minor into southern Russia. They explore into Syria beyond. They go into areas that become Parthian, though uh, the Parthian Empire is receding at the moment as Armenia expands. Um, you know, they can make or break kings in this, this era. Caesar will later be dismissive of you know Pompey how fortunate he was to win win victories against such enemies after Caesar's defeated the army of Pontus. But these were serious campaigns. They involved a lot of very long-range operations, difficult logistics, and there were some pretty tough battles, but the Roman armies are good and they're well-led, and they show what they can do. And there are de defeats and disasters when somebody less good with less well-trained troops um, tries to do the same thing. Now, during the 50s, while Caesar's away in Gaul, he goes up there from 58 and doesn't return until the Civil War because he can't lay down his um, command. There are difficulties. Other people appear. The triumvirate struggles a little bit when Caesar's not there because he's probably the sort of the oil that keeps Crassus and Pompey from tearing each other apart. But it, he's also the, the shrewder political operator. You know, he's able to get things done partly because he was consul in 59. There is that ongoing difficulty that if Pompey and Crassus are private citizens, just respected senators, they need somebody else to actually go and propose something to the Senate, to the people, um, get things done. There are plenty of other ambitious politicians around. Before Caesar has left for Gaul, a chap called Clodius, who is from the 
Appius Claudius family, old patrician family, decides to get himself adopted by a plebeian, changes his name from Claudius to Clodius, so that he can be elected tribune of the plebs because he's seen the possibility. So again, he's like the Gracchi, but even more so, he's somebody from a really important, very influential, well-connected family who thinks that I can take the powers of tribune and I can do all sorts of things with that. And he becomes a major figure. He takes on and takes out Cicero using the pretext that Cicero had unlawfully killed Roman citizens and distinguished ones of the Catilinarian conspiracy. He attacks him and Cicero discovers that you can be the hero of the Republic one year and then a little bit later, because you are the new man from Arpinum, you don't have lots of established connections that will stand by you when you're looking vulnerable. And Clodius picks on him, Cicero goes into exile because nobody will support him. And Caesar has made approaches to him, but Cicero rebuffs him, probably a mistake, but you know, Cicero is trying to calculate what's best and what he feels is right. Pompey doesn't back him after a while. He is, goes into exile. Clodius then demolishes Cicero's house and you know, burns it down, basically, to prove that, look, I can take out somebody who's a former consul and someone who's been right at the top of things, so be very careful how you treat me. He uses gangs based around the um, business clubs and the um, of uh, within the city, starts to exploit these. And another chap called Milo appears. People can sometimes read these years as everything being, you know, the strings are being pulled by people like Pompey from behind the scenes. It's nowhere near as simple as that. Men like Milo, men like Clodius were not puppets of anybody else. They were ambitious Roman politicians. Now, Caesar and Clodius have a difficult relationship because he's the fellow who'd crept into Caesar's house during the Bonadea scandal and slept with Caesar's wife, allegedly, the one Caesar then divorces. Um, and they are, you know, ultimately they're rivals, but sometimes they cooperate. So uh, Clodius is not Caesar's man, but sometimes it suits them to, to work together. What you end up with, with elections that are um, disturbed by violence, by rioting and public meetings becomes more of a problem. It's very difficult to control things. And there are politicians out there. Nobody's quite clear whether Clodius is going to attack um, Caesar, Pompey, Crassus, these others. You know, there are, are rumours that Pompey gets frightened, that he's in, in fear for his life, this sort of thing. Um, in 56, you have Pompey, Crassus and lots of other senators will walk all the way up to Cisalpine Gaul and Lucca, where they have a conference with Caesar, because again, he can't leave his province. So while it's unusual for Roman senators to leave Italy and um, they sort of they, they arrange this so this can happen so we can all go and talk to Caesar and they, you know, they, they make arrangements. This leads to the consulship of Crassus and Pompey, their second consulship in 55. No great problem with that. It's 15 years since they were consuls before. And um, in 54, Crassus goes out to, uh, gets an eastern, gets province of Syria, um, and makes it fairly clear that he's planning a Parthian expedition from the start. Now, I've talked more about the Battle of Carhai in another video, and there's stuff from the Eagle and the Lion Roman Persia book, which... Um, you can look out for that and we'll maybe do some more this month because the paperback of the British edition is coming out in July. But essentially Crassus goes off, he intervenes in Parthia, it's too late, the civil war's already over, marches in very confidently, trying to do the sort of thing that Pompey and Lucullus has done and discovers that the Parthians are a very different proposition. His army is badly defeated at, at Carhai, his son and a substantial detachment is wiped out. Uh, Publius Crassus takes his own life, his head is paraded by the Parthians before Crassus. Crassus has a bit of a breakdown, then recovers, then retreats. His army gets harried very savagely during the retreat and he is killed negotiating with the Parthians for surrender. So Crassus is out of the way and um, you know the Parthians are just more dangerous. So let's come back and let's look at Caesar in Gaul in slightly more detail. It's a five-year command to start off with, and that gives him the opportunity to plan for a prolonged campaign, although in fact things start out 
a little earlier than he expected when the Helvetii do migrate. They try and go through Transalpine Gaul. He gets there in time to block them on the Rhone, but then they move into uh, Free Gaul, and the Aedui and other allied tribes protest that they're being raided and harassed by the uh, Helvetii as they pass through. Caesar intervenes. From the concentration of his troops, he has four legions at the start. Three of them are in Cisalpine Gaul Illyricum. It looks as if he might have been actually wondering about a Danubian campaign, pushing perhaps towards Dacia. It's united under the, the King Borobista at this time. Probably no coincidence that in 44 BC, Caesar, just before he was murdered, was planning to leave Rome to go not just to campaign against the Parthians, but before that to go and fight the Dacians. So there's, there's, there are obviously concerns and a, a possibility there. But instead, the Helvetii offer him the opportunity to um, intervene, win glory. So it's he needs profit, he needs glory. He is hugely in debt. Um, during the course of his campaigns in Gaul, he will make himself a rich man, having paid off all those debts and was rich enough to reward and give loans, give gifts to plenty of other people to win them over. So he um, decides to intervene. He takes the Helvetii on, chases after them to protect his allies or Rome's allies. He keeps invoking the Cimbrian Teutones, reminding people of that, which again is within living memory. Um, I mean, Caesar wasn't around then, but there's still a few people who could remember that, who would have been young when that was going on. He defeats the Helvetii, and it's, you know, obviously we have Caesar's account of all of this, and that's largely what we have. Um, there aren't many other ancient sources that present information that you, doesn't seem to be derived from Caesar's own narrative. There are a few little fragments, but it tends to be anecdotes, not always easy to date. You get some rumours from Cicero, um, you get the indication from um, him mentioning that he's had a letter from Quintus. Well, Quintus was Caesar's legate and they were they were both in Britain, uh, but he doesn't really tell you anything about what Quintus said about what's happening. He goes on to other things. So there are lots of people are corresponding back. Caesar didn't have full freedom to invent. And again, there's the talk on Caesar as a general where we go into this in more detail. Broadly speaking, they are accurate but favourably presented. So they are... Um, Caesar's view of what he would like people to uh, feel and think about his campaigns, but he couldn't really invent things. He largely just had to uh, present them in a way that favours him. But he does have the advantage that his achievements were, by Roman standards, pretty justified and spectacular. You know, you can't doubt the scale of his successes, whatever you think about the man himself and why he was doing it. So obviously you've got the famous Galliarest omnis divisa in partes tres, quaramunum in colant belgae, alium aquitani, tertium qui absorum lingua celtae, nostra galli appellantur. Gaul is divided into three parts, one of which is inhabited by the Belgae, another by the Aquitani, and a third by a people called in their own tongue Celtae in the Latin Galli. So you can see the empire before Caesar's campaigns, where you've got an indication of what's happened with Pompey in the, the east. You know, things have been expanding. The Roman, Roman con directly controlled territory is substantially larger than it had been 100 years before. And um, near to it, you've got lots of allied territory, which is similar. Caesar will intervene against um, successive opponents. So he goes to help the Aedui against the Helvetii, defeats the Helvetii. The Aedui um, have been rivals with the Sequani. The Sequani send envoys, so Caesar claims that complains about the ally they brought in to help them against the Aedui, a German warlord called Ariovistus, who's basically taken over their territory. Caesar goes and opposes him. Again, the, the talk on Caesar as general, we do this in more detail. Um, if you look at this map, you'll get a sense of the scale of Caesar's campaigns, how he moves from one area to the other. In the next year, in 57, he'll go against the Belgic tribes again because they have provoked, they've attacked Rome's allies. And as he acquires new allies, he basically buys into new arguments, new rivalries, and they're useful things for him to exploit. Um, it's the Remi in that case. In 56, the army splits up. This is the year of the Conference of Lucca. This is the year when Caesar's looking back at Rome, not quite sure what's going to happen. Um, so there's an element of treading water but it's also this is the nature of the country he's fought the big groups 
the big united confederations, the ones under big leaders. Now it's sending different columns to deal with individual tribes. Again, the basis is always the same. People who've attacked our allies, who've threatened Roman prestige. Um, so it develops and... Um, after that, you've got the consulship in 55. This will lead to Pompey and Crassus. Crassus gets his eastern camp, uh, command, which obviously goes badly for him. Pompey gets command of um, provinces in Spain, but doesn't go there. And then um, they extend Caesar's tenure of office by another five years. Now, there'll be considerable doubt over precisely, you know, is it five years added on to five, ten in total, right? Start, at which point does it start, or is it five years on from 55? When they, and this will become controversial when you build up to the Civil War. We don't actually know, and it might well be that it wasn't clear at the time. That's, that's most likely. 55 BC, Caesar bridges the Rhine, he crosses to Britain for the first time, and is given the longest period of public thanksgiving for a Roman victory given to any Roman commander up to this point. You know, it is celebrated with great enthusiasm. People are really excited because Britain is so exotic, so mysterious. He returns in 54 on a larger scale, and its, its propaganda value is immense, even if, you know, Cicero says, well, we're not likely to get... Um, not much gold reserves though. they don't seem to be much in the way of minerals and the sort of slaves we can get won't be worth much money because they're not going to be specialists you know you're not going to find your craftsmen and your um teachers and people like that there so it is an exciting thing and it's it commands public attention in the same way that pompey went and stood in the temple in jerusalem um that's you know the first thing nobody's done that that's People talk about it. Caesar going to Britain is on the same scale. Bridging the Rhine on the same scale. It's something, wow. You know, and Caesar, throughout the commentaries, he talks about Nostri, our men, our boys, our lads. You know, These are our victories. This is, for a patriotic Roman, this is really exciting stuff. And that's always part of it and that's why most probably he's releasing his commentaries year by year or at least a version of them that's very close to the the final one we have to celebrate to everybody else to be read out loud and say wow look at what our lads are doing out there look what they're doing under caesar isn't this great the republic's becoming stronger everything is so um successful so Caesar's campaigns are uh, sort of steadily escalating, and you can see it in the size of his army. Again, we talk about this in more detail at um, in the, the the one on Caesar as a general, but how he goes from... And he's a relatively inexperienced militarily when he gets to Gaul, and even by Roman standards, you know, he has, because he started his career quite late. He's done well in Spain, but it's quite possible that many people didn't expect him to do so spectacularly well in Gaul when he went there in 58, because it's a surprise. Um, and his senior subordinates, at least at the start, are not the big names. He, they are people who prove to be very good, and the people like Labienus, his most successful subordinate, uh, but they come from relatively unimportant families. They're not from the the heart of the aristocracy. They're often men who've, who've associated with, with Pompey in particular and perhaps with Crassus. Um, Caesar rubbishes someone who's come who'd done well under Sulla for him and you know, blames him for a, a night operation that's botched early on. Um, and he expands the army from four legions to six to eight. Um, he then loses one in the winter of 54-53 when you get the first large-scale rebellion, but replaces that. It's back up to 10 by 52, two of them on loan. It'll increase to 11 plus. So, you know, the army has almost trebled um, in the course of his campaigns from the four legions he inherits from somebody else. And remember, occasionally you get stuff said about how, you know, Caesar's 10th is always his 10th and it, it's been associated with him from Spain on. So no evidence of that. These, that's not the case. These are legions he takes over, but he turns into his own army and makes ferociously loyal to himself. The first rebellion leads to this one disaster where 15 cohorts are wiped out. Caesar is very careful to pass the blame onto other people, but nevertheless, Suetonius writing later on will say, when well, you're in charge, basically that it's his big defeat because um, he's the overall commander, even if he wasn't actually there. 
Uh, Quintus Cicero holds out heroically uh, soon afterwards, and there's a there's a great contrast in the way Caesar writes the account in Book Five of the Gallic Wars between how everybody from the commanders, the centurions, the soldiers behave the wrong way with Cotta and Sabinus, the men who were defeated, and the right way with Cicero. Uh, it's an interesting sort of illustration of what sort of behaviour Romans thought was proper, which again we can talk about another day. Um, in 53 to 52, beginning in the winter, there's the major rebellion of Vercingetorix, um, which you know is a pretty desperate affair. Caesar is not with the main army when it breaks out. He gets there, but he has to concentrate. You have the siege of Avaricum. Vercingetorix obviously had considerable charisma and ability. He unites the tribes to a degree that's not happened before. And the hint in Dio that he's someone who's actually done rather well and has been um, one of Caesar's allies before then and promoted by Caesar is quite interesting. It, it, Caesar doesn't mention that, but then obviously he probably wouldn't. Um, the Idu even will eventually join Vercingetorix, um, you know, Rome's oldest ally, the ones who claim Trojan descent, so our, our brothers, the Idu even, fight with Vercingetorix. You have the successful siege and capture of Avaricum and the brutal sack of that city where the soldiers, in part as reprisal for the massacre of Roman merchants, but also because they're scared and desperate, run amok. Uh, normally you don't slaughter the population because you want to take them as slaves and sell them, you want to profit from them. At Cogovia they attack, they get repulsed. Caesar represents this as his army being and his centurions being too brave and getting out of hand, not hearing the command to recall them, all this sort of thing. But it's another defeat, but not a critical one, um, leading to the big siege of Elysia with its double siege lines and um, the eventual... Um, surrender of Vercingetorix, but after a very hard fight, you know, you don't need to be um, overly suspicious of all of this because um, just because we know Caesar's the one who's telling the story, you know, this is a tough thing. It could easily have gone wrong, and there were rumours back in in Rome that you know, things have gone badly wrong. Eventually, Caesar wins, and he does it through. Um, his ability, his improvisation, and the quality of his army. You know, these are very important things, and they just don't quit, and they keep on finding a way between them. Um, the army is efficient, extraordinarily loyal. It is probably the, the peak of efficiency of the Roman military at this time, because they, you know, these campaigns are very intensive. There's quite a lot of heavy fighting, both battles and sieges. They get used to winning. They get used to winning under Caesar. Um, he promotes people, so centurions get moved to other legions in more senior roles to sort of spread out the thing. And if you're talented, Caesar will reward you. And everybody's rewarded and given a generous share of the spoils. Now, Later sources talk about the, the killing of a million people during the, the campaigns in Gaul, Germany and Britain. Hard to know whether that's true or not, but the figure for a million enslaved probably is very close to it because there would have been records kept about this because, again, people become commodities and are sold on. And this is spread generously throughout the army, but also Caesar is using this money to back politicians back in Rome, doing what Crassus had been doing before, making loans to people, making gifts to people, helping them in their electoral campaigns. He buys up property to build what will become the um, the Julian Forum, Caesar's Forum in Rome itself, relatively little of which is visible today because it's mostly under Mussolini's road and it's sort of it's behind the, the Curia, the Senate House. Um, all of this happening while things are remaining chaotic and often disturbed in Rome itself. We don't have much of it. There were originally... Um, there was a whole book of letters from Caesar to Cicero and presumably vice versa that was known in the ancient world that's, that's been lost, it didn't survive. Um, but we clearly get the indication that Caesar is writing letters to people back in Rome throughout his Gallic campaign. And there are you know, comments in Suetonius about how quickly he wrote and how he could dictate to more than one scribe at a time to keep people, um, you know, to keep because they couldn't keep up with him. Um, he's always got one eye on what's happening in Rome and in particular, but in Italy in general, in the wider empire. 
and you have all these problems. You've had Clodius and Milo, you've had Cicero forced into exile and then recalled when people are trying to curb what Clodius is doing. Uh, one of the consul, one of the people standing for the consulship of 55, Domitius Ahenobarbus, had wanted to replace Caesar in the Gallic command. There's a family connection with um, the conquest of Transalpine Gaul back in the second century BC. Um, the conference at Lucca, the arrangement, the renewal of the alliance between the Triumvirs prevents that. Pompey and Crassus are the, the consuls in 55. Um, Pompey's given the two Spains then, as we mentioned. Crassus goes off, but Crassus is killed. And that unbalances the relationship. Pompey had probably been able to accept Crassus as an equal and had always been smug in the, you know, smugly content that essentially well, Crassus might have all this money, be a good political operator, but I'm the I'm the great general. You know, I'm the poster boy for Roman military success for the last few decades. I won victory after victory. What did he do? He just defeated a load of slaves and gladiators, and even I had to come along and finish that off for him. Um, but they are Crassus was a few years older than than Pompey. There's about six years difference between Pompey and Caesar, but although Crassus is ten years older than Pompey, nine ten. Um, their careers started at the same time, it's just that Crassus was older and doing things in a more normal way. Pompey has married Julia, Caesar's daughter, and that's been an important relationship because clearly it's, it's a happy marriage. It's, uh, Julia may well have had her father's charm, her ability to win people over, and perhaps, you know, Pompey, I think, was particularly if flattered, was one of those people who was nice to be around and responded to adoration, whether it was from his soldiers, whether it was from the, the crowd, and, and couldn't cope really with rejection. So that's... Um, been a bond, but then in 54 BC, Julia dies in childbirth and the child dies soon afterwards. Pompey will marry um, Metellus Scipio's uh, daughter Cornelia, who is the widow of Publius Crassus, who's been killed at Carhai, so Crassus's son. So in one sense, you see this as, oh, well, you know, this is Pompey moving towards Caesar's opponents in the Senate, but actually... This is someone who was married to a Crassus until very recently. It isn't as simple as that. The Roman aristocracy don't quite divide as neatly and as simply. It's all about making a good connection. Julia was a very good connection for Pompey, and it was a happy marriage. Cornelia is another good connection for Pompey, even if Caesar might have preferred Pompey to have married somebody associated with him, but he doesn't have another daughter. But it does mean that the bond between the two is there. Caesar's been getting more and more famous. He's spending money. He's developing the, the, the forum. Um, you know, even Cicero gets excited by some of Caesar's triumphs. Cato has tried to depict Caesar as violating Roman faith when he attacked the Usipetes and other Germanic tribes during a truce. Caesar, in his commentaries, tries to explain that, oh, well, you know, they were up to no good, they were treacherous first, therefore I just um, it had to do with this, uh, had to do it that way. Um, you don't get the impression that, that Cato gets much traction with this as an idea, you know, recall Caesar, punish him, all this sort of thing. Um, but there are problems, and again, it's not just about Pompey and Caesar. There are lots of other ambitious politicians all trying to get to the top. There are people like Mark Antony, relatively early in their career, who go and accept Caesar's support. Curio is another one. Um, Brutus and others are starting out. They have different attitudes. How do you do this? Cato is a big figure, but Cato is not going to get elected. He's getting beaten. He's not going to get make the consulship. Um, Clodius and Milo are still there, they are still fighting. Clodius wants to be consul, but in 52 BC there is repeated rioting that, first of all, in the autumn of 53 had pre prevented the elections from occurring because there were too many disturbances. And this is far larger scale and involves far more injury and death than the the protests, the riots of 59 BC, of Caesar's consulship. You know, this is much nastier, and I do wonder if one of the reasons people get so frightened of Caesar is they're not actually thinking of what he did, but what they've seen most recently, and they're just assuming that the same thing will happen because Caesar's a popularist, Caesar's a radical politician. Again, I uh, won't talk too much about Optimates Popularis, that sort of thing. I've got the, the video on it elsewhere to explain why I'm not seeing this as a, um, a sort of determining feature throughout that. But there's fighting. 
Clodius is killed. Uh, first of all, he's badly injured in fighting with Milo's men outside Rome. They then make sure Milo sends people in. They finish him off. He's, he's murdered. His supporters take him into the centre of Rome. They cremate him in the Senate House, in the Senate building. Pompey is appointed to restore order with his troops because he's a magistrate with Imperium, even though he is governor of all the Spains, or both the Spains, and shouldn't really come into the city without laying down that thing. He becomes briefly sole consul for 52 before he appoints or arranges for the election of Metellus Scipio as his colleague, um, you know, the man whose daughter he's just married. And they restore order with troops in the city. Now, you're not supposed to bring armed formed bodies of troops into Rome itself unless it's part of a triumphal procession. So you're building up to the tension and the build-up of civil war where Caesar's got lots of opponents and he's safe as long as he's in office. He cannot be prosecuted whilst he's governor of Gaul and what he wants to do is come back and stand for the consulship for 49 BC, which would be 10 years after his first consulship, so it's actually legitimate to do this, become consul, be immune from prosecution, presumably do more reforms, and get another command, which would then make him safe again afterwards. His opponents want the opposite in that they want him to be a, an ordinary citizen and therefore liable to prosecution. Pompey's position is confusing a lot of the time, and it's, his support is limited and there's an element where you feel he almost wants Caesar to accept him as his superior and to show that he's deferential to Pompey, that, OK, I trust you as my friend to protect me. Um, the problem is Pompey doesn't have a good reputation. He's failed to protect Milo, whom he backed in the past, but who is brought to trial for the murder of Clodius and the violence associated with that. And troops parade around it. Cicero um agrees to defend milo writes this wonderful speech but when he gets there is so intimidated by a hostile crowd of uh supporters of clodius that um he doesn't deliver the speech milo goes into exile and <laughs> writes this rather ironic reply when cicero sends him <laughs> a copy of the speech that he was going to deliver and how marvelous it was no oh, i could have got you off uh but i'm afraid i was too too frightened to do it um so well you know i'd never have tasted them the mullets of um massilia um because he goes into voluntary exile and goes to Massilia, as most of them do. It's quite complicated, all the different stages you go through, all the politicking, all the, the um, manoeuvring, but essentially, the poet Lucan perhaps summed it up later on, writing under Nero, when he says that the, you know, the root of the civil war is that Pompey would not accept an equal and Caesar could not accept a superior. There's an element. Caesar sees, feels that he has deserved a good reception and more honours at Rome. After all, he's had more days of public thanksgiving awarded him than anybody else in history. He's won lots of wars. He's made the Roman Republic stronger, greater, more profitable. And he's done it in a command that he was given by the Roman people. And, you know, he's fulfilled their trust in him, that sense. And that any attempt to prosecute him, whether or not he can say, look, I prove I'm innocent, I didn't do this, doesn't matter. You're damaged simply by being brought to court and you cannot trust that trial to be fair because look what happened to Milo, to others um, in recent years, to Gabinius, the man who you know, brought in the, the pirate law for Pompey, um, ends up being um, prosecuted eventually successfully for misbehaviour in Egypt, among other things. Um, Pompey expects Caesar to back down. Caesar expects Pompey in the Senate to back down. From hindsight, you look and you think, well, what could have been so bad about a, a second consulship for Caesar that made it worthwhile tearing the Roman world apart in civil war? Um, Caesar decides, I mean, he will later say, after Pharsalus, supposedly looking at the Pompeian dead, you know, they wanted this, but for my army, they would have passed judgment on me. That's his view. He fights a civil war to protect his position in public life. Pompey, Cato, the others who oppose him fight the civil war to deny Caesar that place in public life. And it really comes down to that. There's no real ideology in this. It's all about what will happen to Caesar. And it is, it's a sign of a state that isn't working very well. If you give somebody all these, this, this, these awards, all this strength, all this opportunity, and then want to hit him down afterwards when he's actually done what you've asked him to do. Um, it's just he's got famous in the, the process. Um, you know, again, Cicero bitterly comments, why, why fight Caesar now after you're making him strong? You know, what's, <laughs> I don't see the logic. Cicero and many others 
do feel that however shameful some of Caesar's demands were that you could have avoided the civil war by giving in to him. Again, it's very hard to see what would have been so terrible, uh, particularly we know that there will be a civil war that Caesar will win. What you get through opposing him is dictatorship and the assumption that that's what he was aiming from all along, which is what his opponents will say, is, is actually hard to justify. We don't know. Uh, and probably not. Probably Caesar would have been quite content with being acknowledged as the top man or one of two top men um, with Pompey in Rome's public life, having the distinction, the auctoritas, the honours that he felt his ability and his distant ancestry had always deserved, and doing things well. That's the thing. You come back to what we were talking about last time. So much of the leadership of the Roman state in the 60s, 70s, uh, 50s and before has been incompetent, has been staggeringly corrupt in ways that men like Pompey and Caesar were not. They were capable. Yes, they made a profit, but they did a damn good job. And you need people like that in the state. And it, it's the difficulty. There is always the sense you feel as well that some like Cato and others who see Pompey as a useful tool to be used against Caesar. Because without Pompey, they can't stand up against Caesar. But Pompey has imperium, he has command of legions, although they're in Spain. And he's the great military man, the great hero of the Republic. They don't like Pompey, but probably the thinking is that we can cut Pompey down to size because he's a pretty inept politician. So although you get you know, these depressed comments from Cicero and others that whoever wins the Civil War, you know, we're just going to end up with one master ahead of all of us, um, because it's either going to be Pompey or Caesar, I suspect a lot of them think that Pompey can be marginalised. Um, he's just not as skillful. Caesar's too clever. He's too good at this game that we can't trust him. So there's a lot more to it that there's a lot more we could say and we probably will one day but let's just get on with the story for the moment. Caesar crosses the Rubicon in January 49 BC, Acta Alia Est and uh, probably in Greek actually and you know, the, dice are the dice are rolled but not yet fallen. Um, north of the boundary he was legally within his province, legally could command troops. South he's in Italy and unless coming back to lead those troops in triumph which has not formally been awarded to him yet, then this is illegal. However, even then, there are weeks where Caesar's trying to negotiate. And even at this point, you feel it could have been sorted out. He actually asks to meet Pompey in person. Pompey's allies won't let him do this because they probably don't trust Pompey not to be charmed by Caesar. And maybe they don't trust him not to see the common sense thing that actually, do I really need to fight this civil war? What's in it for me? Um, and the destruction that's involved, the risk that's involved. Pompey had famously said beforehand, you'd be dismissive of Caesar, what if Caesar won't give up his command? What if my son has taxed me with a stick? Or boasted that he only had to stamp his foot and legions would spring up out of the soil of Italy. Uh, you know, somebody rather tartly suggests, maybe it's about time you start stamping your foot, old boy, uh, because it doesn't happen. He's not prepared. Even though Caesar only crosses the Rubicon with one legion that's worn down in numbers by the campaigning in Gaul, so isn't full strength or anything like at this point with the 13th. Um, others will join him fairly soon. Pompey doesn't have well-trained troops to oppose them. The only two legions he's got that have been in existence for any length of time and that are in Italy rather than over in Spain are the two that have been loaned to Caesar and have served under Caesar in recent years that the Senate pulled away to be sent as the nucleus for an army to go against the Parthians to protect Syria. In fact, they haven't gone. They're, they're still there. But Pompey is not sure he can trust them because obviously these chaps have been doing very well and been rewarded generously by Caesar. So your best troops are ones that you're not sure about. There is no attempt. Uh, they won't negotiate. Caesar keeps on trying to start negotiations, saying, look, this is all I want, and emphasises his clemency, his clementia. When people fight against him, he defeats them, but he lets them go free afterwards. And it's only the second or sometimes the third time that he will actually then execute them. Um, he talks about a new way of conquest, new way of, of waging war. And the contrast is with Sulla. And that's the fear. Everyone thinks a civil war starts when you're, everyone's going to be like Sulla and Marius, they're going to slaughter anyone who opposes them. Caesar very consciously, very publicly says, no, I'm not going to do that. I am actually going to spare my opponents. I'm going to let them go and I'm going to try and sort this out because in the end we're all Romans. Does rather wrong foot people. Although we talk about Pompey and the Senate fighting Caesar, most people tried to remain neutral as far as they could. And others, Cicero wanted to, ended up eventually after much soul searching, goes off and joins Pompey, but's never really happy in it. Um, 
Others join Caesar. You have um, Caelius, the correspondent of Cicero during Cicero's time in um, Cilicia, says, well, Pompey's got the better cause, but Caesar's got the better army. I'm going to join Caesar. Caesar overruns Italy in a matter of weeks. There's, there's very little concerted opposition and he overcomes it. Um, Pompey takes his army off to Macedonia and builds up. Um, he's able there to draw on all his connections with the eastern provinces that he's recently reorganized, starts to recruit and mass a much bigger army with which to face Caesar. Um, you know, and you get the comment, why are you doing this? Well, Sulla did it, why can't I? Um, and Pompey again shows his talent for organization and training, which he's, he's displayed in the past, even though he's, you know, he's pushing 60 now. He's an old man for a field command by Roman standards, but he trains with the troops, he inspires them. Caesar doesn't have a fleet, he can't follow him, so he ends up going to Spain, defeats the Pompeian legions there. He besieges Massilia, which holds out. Um, he keeps on acting, he becomes... Um, comes back and by the end of the year into 48 he's able to cross the Adriatic and land in Macedonia. Uh, you have a pretty desperate campaign because you can't get too many troops across but it's one of those signs ancient fleets are not really designed to blockade and close sea lanes very well partly because the galleys are by their nature short range because you've got these crews of lots of people who need food and particularly need water so you can't remain in position you tend to try and every couple of days you want to bring them ashore. Um, to rest them, to replenish your um, food and water. Um, ba -ba 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 -bom. So you have the Diahachium campaign in 48 BC, which is almost a defeat. You know, Caesar supposedly comments dismissively that the enemy would have won if they had a commander who knew how to win. Pompey ought to have beaten me there. It was in a really desperate situation, but somehow through the skill of my men, my improvisation, we cling on, we survive, and the enemy didn't have that killer instinct. They let us go. They pull away, and then you have the Battle of Pharsalus much later in the year. In the summer of 48 BC, Pompey's army outnumbers Caesar almost two to one in infantry and 10 to one in cavalry. Um, but Caesar wins. Pompey concentrates his cavalry on one flank, um, tries to overwhelm them. Caesar puts a few cohorts concealed behind his cavalry. They appear as the, the l numerous but not that experienced Pompeian cavalry has probably gone into a big sort of mass the, and they basically stampede them. And the better quality of Caesar's troops and the fact that they've broken this one flank lead to a defeat. Pompey abandons his army and gallops away. Most un-Roman thing to do, but it is really over there. Uh, men like Brutus, men like Cicero will surrender to Caesar in the aftermath of this and be treated extremely well. Both Brutus and Cassius will be given magistracies. They'll be made praetor by Caesar um, within a year or so. Again, this policy of clemency continues. Caesar will chase Pompey, who's heading off and ends up in Egypt where he's murdered. Um, by Cleopatra's brother, who thinks this will win Caesar's favour. Cleopatra is fighting a war against her brother. Caesar arrives in Alexandria in the middle of it, desperate for money. He starts to claim all the money that had been promised to restore their, uh, the um, Ptolemy Alutis, Ptolemy XII, Cleopatra's father, to power, promised to Caesar, to Pompey, to Crassus and others. Um, intervenes in the civil war. Cleopatra makes Caesar a far better offer than her brother can match. You, know, you famously have her being brought in, not in a carpet, but in a laundry bag. They've been corresponding beforehand. And again, there's that, uh, the, Caesar and Cleopatra want things, they want political support. They're, they're, they're politicians at heart, they always have their ambition and they're thinking of that and they're manipulating the other, but there is also this element of closeness that seems there that isn't necessarily with Caesar's many other mistresses. And again, comes back to Sevilla, this sense of this is someone ferociously intelligent, charismatic. It's somebody very much like him. Um, someone he can treat more of an equal, even though there's a big, big difference in age, obviously. Um, again, we can talk about Cleopatra another day. So Caesar is caught there. He spends the winter in Alexandria and gets caught up in the Civil War. Again, a rather disparate situation, but eventually relief forces, largely Allied troops, come and rescue him. Ptolemy is killed or dies in the, the defeat of his army. Cleopatra installed with her younger brother, again, as um, 
rulers of Egypt, uh, you have the birth of, or you will have, she becomes pregnant, you'll have Caesarian being born, and there's all that issue as well. But that's, that's a, another bigger thing we don't need to go into this time. It, but while all this has been going on, bad stuff has happened elsewhere. And you, you, you feel as a sense Caesar was exhausted and has almost rested during this period. But Euphanakes of Pontus is invaded, has defeated one of Caesar's armies. He has to go off to defeat him in 46 BC, the Zela campaign, where he wins this very quick victory, leading to the slogan later on in the triumph, Vini, Vidi, Vici, you know, I came, I saw, I conquered. Um, but also Pompeian survivors, Metellus Scipio, Labienus, the uh, Caesar's former subordinate from Gaul, but who sided with Pompey in the Civil War, and Cato and others have mustered a large army in North Africa. This then leads, Caesar goes briefly back to Italy. You then have the Thapsus campaign in North Africa. Another tough fight, um, but Caesar wins. And in the aftermath, um, the Pompeian leaders, many of the, the main ones are either killed or commit suicide. Cato will commit suicide at Utica, hence his, his later name, Cato Utikensis. And you, know, you have the story, he stabs himself in the stomach and doesn't die. His son brings in a surgeon, they sew him up. But while, it, while they've left him again afterwards, Cato sort of rips open his own wounds, pulls out his entrails and dies in this spectacularly gruesome manner because... He does not want to accept Caesar's clemency because he believes that Caesar doesn't have the right to extend this clemency to him. No one should have that power and it would be humiliating to accept it. You have then Pompey's eldest son, Gnaeus Pompeius, is in Spain with Labienus and others and they raise another army back in Spain where Pompey has all these connections leading to the 45 BC, the Munda campaign, which Caesar wins. But again, this is a particularly desperate fight and you, you wonder if Caesar is starting to get exhausted, starting to think whether his luck's running out. Um, it's another brutal campaign, but Caesar wins. And he wins because he's got a better army. He's probably a better general, at least at this stage. He might have been tactically anyway. Pompey's the great organiser, the great planner, but sometimes fumbles it. He hasn't done all that well against Sertorius, another able leader. He's sort of very good at punishing the average. He's possibly not so good at facing real sort of you know, first team opposition. But again, it's hard to tell. Um, he's older, he doesn't have such a good army, he's got the problem that whereas Caesar can say, this is what I'm going to do, Pompey faces debate with all the leading senators who are criticising him. He fights the Battle of Pharsalus because people are criticising him for deliberately extending the war, that he wants to be king, they're nicknaming him Agamemnon, all this sort of thing. Um, he faces that problem. Um, Caesar takes a lot of risks. Again, we can go back to the... the the, the talk on Caesar as a general for far more detail on this, but he gets himself out of it. And that risk-taking is pretty Roman. You know, the level of aggression Caesar displays is very, very Roman. He is charismatic. He's a great improviser. You've got the, you know, the mutiny of the 10th Legion before the Thapsus campaign, where he addresses the Quirites, citizens, civilians, rather than comilitones, comrades, mates, fellow soldiers. And they break down, and their, their will goes, and they're begging him to decimate them. Um, You've got Caesar the man, you've got the womanizer, you've got the remarkable range of activities in this place. He's, a, he's an interesting man. But I think for today, we'll finish with that and we'll actually look at the dictatorship and then the early stages of the career of Augustus and the rivalry of Mark Antony, Brutus and Cassius next time round. Um, and that might well be quite a good August thing. So we will have had two Conquered and the Proud in July, um, looking at the... The 60s BC, the 50s BC, the first triumvirate, and the the Civil War, fairly briefly. Again, all of these topics are things that in the months and years to come, probably particularly years to come by the time we finish Conquering the Proud, we can come back to specific things. The aim of this is really an overview and to sort of maybe highlight a few new ideas, fresh ways of looking at things for people who are more or less familiar with it already. So that's it for the day, Conquered and the Proud number 10. And um, next time we might have something about Eagle and the Lion, Roman Persia and sieges. I thought I'd give a little bit of an introductory talk about siege warfare because that's quite important. We've also got the next episode of HBO's Rome coming up soon as well. So we've got those to look forward to in the rest of the month. But that's it for today. Thanks for watching.